Episode 34. I think that's one of the amazing things that we have as restaurant people, as, as chefs, to get to do that for a living, to make people happy, to bring people together, not just you know in the front of the house for the customers, but also as people that get to share in the process together. Welcome back to another episode of the Just Forking Around podcast. I showcase here a rotating cast of guests, all from the beautifully insane, sexy world of food and beverage. I am your host, Debbie Salzberg, and we are in for another treat because Chef Chris Hill has returned for part two. Yes, he was showcased on episode 20 back in... It was the end of June when I met him when we recorded and then we released it in July. So a few months back, he just was crushing it with his books. He has a couple books out. His um, I met him actually on TED Talks. I heard him speaking on a TEDx talk. He's had, I think, two, two opportunities where he spoke on stage and... I love this guy. He has a great take on leadership. He, I've read some articles on Medium. He, he definitely is an author as well on that platform. Um, of course, also on, on his books as well, which if you haven't listened to episode 20 yet, I definitely recommend going back to justforkingaround.net forward slash forward slash <laughs> forward slash zero two zero. And you can learn a little bit about his backstory and some of the accolades and accomplishments that he has had over the years. Um, Because part two, we get right into his next. Uh, We talk about his next book. We talk about some insights into crushing your career. He really has a proven path to a sustainable life in the kitchen. Uh, He works a lot with chefs and back of the house team, team building. But you can take any of those principles and use them in your life. And of course we talk food. We always talk food, fun, and kitchen stuff. (laughs) That's what you can expect in this episode. It's all, it's, Chris is always great to have to listen to. He has a great way of delivering his content. So before we get into this episode, I just want to mention again, uh, the sponsor of this podcast today, which is Aura Organic. So aura.organic forward slash just forking around. I love this company. As you all know, I keep I talk about it because I've actually found them on Shark Tank a few months back and was blown away by basically their presentation and I, I became curious. And of course, they're a San Diego-based company, so I had some a slight affiliation all of a sudden with that because I love San Diego and I used to live there for a very long time. And then I saw Chef Ron, Ron Chang, and Will, Will Smelko. And I was like, these two dudes are cool. They have something really great going on. So I purchased the products and I started using them. And then now, voila, I'm a huge fan, huge supporter of Aura Organic. And for the Just Forking Around listeners, you all, I'm able to offer a sweet, sweet deal for you all for this sustainable supplement company. So at checkout, after you go to aura.organic forward slash just forking around, put the code in just forking around, just forking around, and you will receive a 15% discount on your entire order always, not just one and then done. A couple of notes on products that I really love. I love Trust Your Gut. It is a pre and probiotic. I use the I, I don't use the pills. Those are really good too, but I love the powder because I just mix it in my water in the morning and boom, I'm good to go for the day for my pre and probiotic. And it's sustainable and you know it's soy-free, it's plant-based, it's vegan, it's non-GMO. It, it's all of those very important factors that are non-negotiables, I don't know, for me and I'm assuming for a lot of you as well. So trust your gut. And of course, everybody's day and your repertoire of daily routines cannot be complete without some type of green, taking some type of green powder. Uh, this one I take is called Easy Bean Green, organic alkaline greens powder. It comes in a month's supply. I just take a scoop. I mix it in with my water. You can put in anything, smoothie, juice. I just go straight up with water, ingest it, and I'm good to go. And I know that I've had enough greens for my day. So, I mean, of course I add salads and what fruits and everything to it. But these are, you know, they even can contain like Ayurvedic herbs like ashwagandha, tafala to boost the immune systems. 
and aid in the digestion. Digestion is important. And again, everything is USDA certified organic. And getting back to the greens powder, they have 20 veggies, grasses, herbs, algae, and superfoods. Huge fan. Organic greens powder. Aura.organic forward slash just forking around. Use just forking around at checkout and enjoy a 15% discount. Now let's actually get into this episode with Chef Chris Hill. Please enjoy. So we just had to do a part two for the listeners since episode 20. Yes, episode 020 is such a popular one. I'm really excited for part two with Chef Chris Hill. Chef, welcome back. Debbie, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast last time. And I expect nothing less today. <laughs> awesome. And you know, you know how we start off every episode with a toast. So I'm ready to raise my glass today. It's only noon. So I'm, I, have a, I have a sparkling water today. And I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm on my second coffee. I just did a French press coffee with a little bit of uh, cream. And I'm toasting to experience today, experience to, to learn from our past mistakes, experience to uh, meet new people and experiences like this with, with yourself. I love it. All right. Cheers. Chin, chin. I think the last time you had a, a watermelon beer, a high, hell or high watermelon beer. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think I had a little Pinot Grigio or something, or rose. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was summer. <laughs> Full writing mode, so I'm trying to uh, stay sober at least till after happy hour. Okay, <laughs> which is soon, I think, on your coast. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple of things. One, ChrisHillOnline.com is your contact. ChrisHillOnline.com, and two pretty celebratory dates that I missed. I think. Well, I actually maybe did on Facebook. Congratulated you one on your engagement in August 27th. Yes, that's right. Congratulations, and on September 9th was your birthday. Yep. Actually, the 8th. Oh, yeah. the 8th. Okay. After the 8th. Still your Virgo. Awesome. Well, happy birthday and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a fun uh, couple months. So uh, yeah, yeah. new things on the horizon. All right. Yes, and always. Uh, so what I want to do is let's, um, let's uh, nibble down a little deeper on some topics that we touched upon in episode 20 and also some current themes in today's world, really about bringing differences and how that relates to particularly the kitchen culture of a restaurant. So I want to start with um, a, an article that I, uh, you had written in August. And um, I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs and I want to talk about a little bit. It was on August 16th. And this is the last couple paragraphs, quote from you. His death marked the end of a life. But over the next week, I got to enjoy so many wonderful Filipino meals with so many wonderful, wonderful people that were so close to him. The dinner table for a week straight was a celebration of his life the meals that reminded them of him and the important things in this world, family, love, and togetherness. Food, to me, is all of that. Food, without fail, if you let it, can be the ultimate gathering force, the thread binding us all together. Food is the starting point of what we have in common, which is a hell of a lot more than the differences some are so quick to point out. Like with most things in life, it all just depends on what you choose to focus on. So I really love that article, Chris. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And what can you tell us a little bit more about those words that when you were writing them? Well, it's funny. I wasn't quite sure where you were going with this. I was trying to think of what I published on the 16th of August. <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, I got goosebumps as you were reading that. And that was actually uh, Tina, my fiance, her uncle had passed away from cancer and she's half Filipino. So a lot of her family uh, is very close knit and in, in that community, you know, they get together every week to, to celebrate, uh, you know, their culture, um, even if they're not meaning to. And, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, we need to remind ourselves, you know, of really what is important, not just, you know, going to work and, you know, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week and coming home and doing it again the next day, but really remind ourselves of, of what it is that we're after. And I think, at the end of it all, I think we're really all looking for the same things. Yeah. And I love the food part of it. The food is the starting point of what we have in common. I mean, it's like a food and smiles, 
right? Like when you're sitting, if you're sitting at a table and maybe not everybody's on the same culture can speak the same language, but if there's food involved or smiles, it's, it's like the common thread. Yeah, exactly. And, and you think back to like the, the history of food and, and not just in recent history, but like through as culture has evolved, you take you know, something like a, a seafood soup, right? You know, we have like chowders and gumbos here in the United States, but we also have bouillabaisse in, in France and Chipino in, in Italy. So it's a lot of the same ideas and, and using you know, this, the whole the whole animal, the, all the, the, the foods we have from the farms and, and really just, it's, we all have so much in common and it really is the perfect place to start. And I don't think you can be mad at somebody, well, maybe at the Thanksgiving table, but you can't really be mad. <laughs> yes. you can't really, if you're sitting down enjoying a nice meal that somebody thoughtfully prepared for you. And I think that's one of the amazing things that we have as restaurant people, as, as chefs to get to do that for a living, to make people happy, to bring people together, not just, you know, in the front of the house for the customers, but also as people that get to share in the process together. I know. It's, I, I love that. And I, I get chills too when I read that article. And the food is definitely the starting point. I know I, a lot of times I ask at the beginning about um, what was it like at the dinner table? I think we spoke about that on episode 20. But so that was what reminded me was like, you were all kind of at the dinner table for a week straight with a celebration of his life, you know, and the meals that reminded them of him. And that's, that's so, that's so special. I wonder what, what would be a meal that we would be celebrating at your table? If we were celebrating your life, what would be the meals? You know, I I think, you know, I grew up in the South. uh, So I've always been really rooted in, in the traditions of Southern cuisine, Southern cooking, yeah, I love, I have a fine place in my heart for Charleston, which is actually where I got engaged a couple weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so you maybe some shrimp and grits, so things things that we can all, that we don't all maybe have familiarity with uh, in the same context, but we, things that are approachable that, that uh, are just good food, they're you know, good for the soul. Yeah. I think of like chicken and dumplings or chicken biscuits or something, or then like some like, I don't know, delicious fried chicken or I don't know, macaroni and cheese, <laughs> like comforty food. For sure. Like barbecue. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, across the board. Yeah. Uh, and all that stuff is you know, what I grew up with. And really, it's a good, nice fondness of, of my childhood and, and memories of, of you know, going to see my grandparents and, you know, the list goes on. So yeah. it's not a food, but it's really you know, part of your past and part of, you know, whole culture's past. It's true. That's true. I was thinking of, think about like my, family's culture because it's we're Jewish. So there's a lot of traditional dishes at holidays. And the funniest thing is that, not funny, but the most interesting thing is that the holiday that brings us all together, the one that we actually have to all, like it's the unsaid rule by the my mom, the matriarch, you know, is that you have to come home for Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving isn't really a religious or anything. It's just the traditional thing. So it's, um, it's, it's just interesting how that kind of threads through our lives. That stands out. Y'all obviously have some really cool like food culture uh, customs too, and and you know a lot of people you know ask your favorite holiday, and I love I love Christmas, and uh, for you know seeing especially now having some nieces, and you know I'll hopefully have kids in the next couple of years, but I love like like I'm sure your family too. I love Thanksgiving, and it's really again it brings everybody together, and you you can see that old crazy uncle that you haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> and still feel connected and you have your for me it's cousins that I only see a couple times a year but you feel just as close and yeah, yeah. I think food does all this I was re- you know how I always love to um, tell you about something that reminds me of you when I'm reading it <laughs> so I have one I was <laughs> I think the last one we talked about the traveler's gift but this I was listening to a Jay Abraham I think it was a podcast and it re- reminded me of revisiting some of uh, his books that I had and I actually thought of you when I was listening to this one podcast. Um, do you, are you familiar with Jay Abraham? I sure am. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you enjoy him or, I mean, he's a marketing guru and I would assume that. Yeah. Brilliant. So he has, he, this is his take on greatness and goals. And it, it totally reminded me of you. So I'm going to go through a little bit of it and then maybe we can have a little dialogue about it. So his, his, um, take on, on greatness is, well, first, let's say, Jay, he, for people who don't know, he's an American business executive. Um, he's a conference speaker. He's an author. Um, he's known for his developing strategies uh, for direct response marketing back then. And currently, he's just 
doing he's doing a lot of hedge funds and things like that, helping uh, with the World Bank with entrepreneurial efforts in third world countries. I mean, the guy's really just keeps pushing forward. So he's awesome. So his belief on greatness, his belief system first on greatness is that every human being is born with a desire to be great, either a career, friends, lover, great athlete, business, but most settle for mediocrity, but it's only because they haven't been shown what greatness truly is and how to both give and receive it. So this is where the steps come. It reminds me of a little bit about you, Chris, of what you do when you help people or assist them. Um, figure out what greatness is supposed to look like and then decide which area of your life needs greatness first. You know, is it your business or your marriage? Find the pathway to get from that A to B point. And most people try to do everything alone. And what you really need is advocates and champions who care enough to hold you to a higher standard. And the reason some people, quote, aren't good enough is because they've never seen, quote, what good enough looks like. And that greatness is a byproduct of vulnerability. And most people are too afraid to be vulnerable. So I thought about you with your mentorship and your ability to help people really make things happen in their lives. What do you have any thoughts on what I just read to you? I know there's a lot in there. Yeah, I think it's I think it's brilliant. I think it it speaks to to something that we all need to to hear and listen to and and take action with our lives. So not just for ourselves, but also you know reminding the people around us that they're all great too in their own capacities and helping them to kind of harness that and, and, and tap into it is, is essential. And I think for us to, you know, as, as communities, whether that's, you know, big or small, we need to be there to encourage and mentor each other. I mean, you're good at some things. I'm good at some things. What can you teach me? What can I teach you? And how can we encourage each other along the way? Is that a lot of your focus now? I mean, you're, we can tangent a little bit because I know that you're, you know, you're chef, restaurateur, TEDx speaker, book uh, author, <laughs> you know, you have you have a lot of pretty much great um, accolades and experiences up until this point. What's your focus right now? Are you doing a lot with branding and helping people kind of chefs or leadership? What's your focus? Yeah, so kind of a combination of of branding. I'm actually a little bit late for finishing this book called Crush Your Career, which is really about Helping people to identify the opportunities they have in their career to to be successful, not just you know working the line every day, but may, but really taking that into your own hands and not leaving your success uh, in the hands of anyone else. So, what would that look like? So, uh, it's like a proven path to a sustainable life in the kitchen. Uh, you share the tools and the tactics and the strategies to develop a brand for yourself. How successful chefs in the world have done the same. When I was reading about your new book, it really reminded, and that's I think what pinged with me with um with uh, Jay Abraham was because I feel like you really get it, you know, you understand those those principles right there on greatness and the belief systems. So, what is it that without giving the, too much of the book away, because I know that um you know we can we want people to read the entirety of it, but what tips or tools? Well, so yeah, I think to give a little bit of context, chefs for a long time. You know, up until really about maybe let's say 15 years ago, when things like Top Chef started coming around, you know, chefs were in charge of you know running a kitchen, and as long as they had you know a decent menu, consistent food, and you know good costs on their you know their food costs and labor costs, then they were fine. But but now as the chef and the restaurant world has evolved, and we talked about last time, you know how you know all these casual, you know, fine dining restaurants have, have kind of come and emerged and we have the fast casual. There's so much more competition. There's so many more people going to culinary school and learning to become cooks and chefs. So you really have to stand out and find a way to to harness your creativity and your talents in a way that the marketplace is attracted to. And and I learned that really early on, you know, when we opened up the restaurant up here in Virginia back in 2010, I knew that for the restaurant to be successful, I was going to have to build a brand for myself as a chef, which no one knew who I was back then, that would then get people excited about the food we were doing so they'd come in and see us. So so it's really about using the the modern world we live in. I, I take the example of it in the book, uh, Fabio Viviani, who was on Top Chef. He didn't even win. He got second place. But after Top Chef, he is now you know probably the biggest... Uh, top chef alumni there is out there and all that really stemmed from he knew that he had this opportunity there's a, I think a six month time 
gap between actually filming the show and and the airing of it. So he had this six months to kind of start building this brand for himself, to start getting some energy around who he was, to show people what he was about, and to kind of tap into that. And as a result, he was you know, now he owns a bunch of restaurants, a winery, and licenses all these different products, and the list goes on. So I think we need to really say, hey, like I have this chance to not only you know cook in the, in the kitchen every day, but build a brand for myself. I actually recently talked uh, for the book too with Chad Minton of True Cooks, who you know, he was working as a full-time chef for you know, 20 years and saw this opportunity to create a lifestyle brand for chefs called True Cooks. And and how he's evolved that into doing that full-time uh, for he and his wife, and it's been incredibly successful. So things like that that people in our industry aren't necessarily really familiar with, but encouraging them to kind of seek out and make it happen. Yeah. I mean, he he didn't win. He came in second. But he he really didn't. I mean, he's just crushing it, right? I mean, for people that don't know, and that I didn't I didn't really think about that uh, chef about that six month period where he knew that he had that amount of time that it was finite. You know, it was a definitive amount of time to to kind of start building his brand so that when it when it the show was aired, you know, he was able to capitalize or monetize or whatever or whatever it was he wanted to do. You know, maybe not everybody has those dreams or goals, but he was able to kind of harness that it's smart. Right. And, and I think I think now, and this is kind of one of the premises to the book, is now to be a successful chef, restaurateur, you know, whatever you want to call it, I think there's two ways to win you know, on a, on a high level. Uh, and that's to have this, the food speak for itself. So if you're a Thomas Keller or a Dominique Crane or somebody who's just doing incredible over-the-top food that really speaks for itself, then you don't have to really do the marketing. It, it takes care of itself for you. But if you're like a lot of us who do great food, who are good chefs, good cooks, who have an interesting idea, we need to really look at the world we live in and say, hey, like I have a, a chance to tell people about what I'm doing, get people excited about it. And as a result, that's going to help lead to success versus we've see, all seen restaurants that we love that just don't get enough customers. And as a result, they close the doors. Yeah. Yeah. When you walk into restaurants... Which do you have an immediate thought, kind of that trends towards something like you look around, do you or do you look at the food, do you look at what people are in there? Is there something that you immediately identify with, like a couple of things? Well, yeah, I, th- I think a lot of us, and I know you have been around for a long time in the restaurant industry, like myself, and have, especially I've been in front of the house and GM of some places. You know, for me, you walk in somewhere and instantaneously you get a certain vibe. And yeah, you know, I went to this place for brunch over the weekend. It was kind of a last minute thing and it was right on the water. It sounded nice. So we said, hey, we'll give it a shot. And you walked in and you realized why there wasn't a wait for brunch on this place in the water because it just felt old and stale and, and didn't really have this excitement to it. So I, I think that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of you know, trying things and also just building up the culture that is excited to be you know, part of what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, we t- you just had a, a great interview with um on Toast, uh, the guy from Toast, the app. Yeah, on your podcast. So he that was a, that was a great episode. He had some he had some he, that was great intel, and it's about food tech, which is you know the emerging a part of the industry world because what's happening is they're taking systems, you know, where there's problems or ouchies, you know, and fixing them, right? In a sense, or finding the solution. Um, But he talks a lot about culture, you know, and you can take that from from a startup business to the restaurants, to the kitchens, which is what I think that that you you focus on a lot with... um, with your in your talks and with your uh, clients on creating that culture. And if you scale, how to keep that culture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it really applies to to whatever, you know, a lot of what I've learned is, is through you know, reading and like, like you with Jay Abraham, like lead, reading and listening to, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs, but also you reading and, and paying attention to my, you know, my favorite coaches. So it, it's a lot of the same ideas that are very replicable, whatever it is we do with our teams and our communities. Yeah. So are you, you're currently, give us a rundown of where, what you're doing right now. You're, you were in the process of writing, like what, what's your surroundings? You at your desk or where, what state are you in? <laughs> what's your, what's your <laughs> environment right now? Where are you? <laughs> I'm uh, Virginia beach. 
uh, actually right near a naval base. So if we if we hear any planes flying over, they're getting ready for North Korea. Oh shit! Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you did you have any hurricane issues, or are you good? Actually, you know this most recent one, uh, Maria, just uh, is right off the east coast. We got a little bit of wind from that, but aside from that, uh, we got uh, pretty lucky uh, with everything. So. Yeah, but yeah, I'm right now I'm in the, uh, the living room. I have a, an office upstairs that I, I should probably be working in to keep me more focused, but it, this is easy and it's comfortable and it's what's worked so far. <laughs> so when you were, went to Chapel Hill, how far, just give me, so I, because I'm not, I'm a little bit, I'm not so schooled in that arena of North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, those areas. How far is Chapel Hill from, so why did you, you said you got engaged in Chapel Hill? No, I'm sorry, Charleston. Oh, it's in Charleston. Okay, got it. I thought I said okay. It was in Charleston. Got it. That makes more sense. Uh, I thought you said Chapel Hill. That's, like, that's a three-hour drive, uh, Raleigh, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel, Chapel Hill area. So yeah, which is a really awesome area. I have some family in Durham, and I love going down there. Nice. I had interviewed a gentleman. It's called Sup Dogs. S U P Sup Dogs. He was on um, episode. I think it was a couple after you. Twenty two. He had a great has a great had a great story as well. But and then um, once I interviewed him, then I started interviewing a couple other people that have been on the show from that area. So it was just interesting. All of a sudden, there was like I was focusing on that that Chapel Hill area and and the beach area, New Jersey Shore. I don't know. It was just how that happens. But <laughs> there's some great chefs in the area and there's you know so, so many great farms for some reason they're really open and receptive to new ideas and trying new things and it's been fun to my actually cousin owned a, a coffee shop there for about five years so you know, i get down there as often as i could to uh enjoy the scene down there it's, it's, it's a lot of fun good energy nice so going back to, to we'll go back to jay abrams abraham but what what did you learn from what was your most prominent takeaway or two from um, your interview on your podcast with the Toast gentleman. I don't remember his name, but he's the food tech. Uh, yeah, Steve Fredette. And um, yeah, he was one of the owners and founders of Toast. And, you know, I think for me, it was really about creating a culture as receptive to new ideas, as receptive to that can do, uh, is conducive to people being able to do their best. You know, whatever that looks like for your organization. I think for for a lot of us, we get so caught up in, in the numbers and and making the the sales work for investors, whether it's a big company or a small company, and we forget about the day to day operations and what's going to help make those numbers work. And it's really the people that work for us. Yeah, absolutely. And that's coming back on to greatness and the and the belief system that you know people settle for mediocrity just not because they are lazy or lame. It's because they maybe haven't been shown greatness or they, there's a leap of logic, right? Like where, what does that look like? And going back to that, I think that that's something that your, your um, really talents, your talent lays in a la- helping people uh, kind of move through that and become great. <laughs> like honestly, yeah, with your mentorship. <laughs> One thing that I think ties into that idea is from my favorite coach, I went to the University of Alabama, our coach, Nick Saban, he says, you know, leadership is caring enough about someone else to teach them something for their benefit. You know, a lot of us, when we're day-to-day managing, it's like, hey, I need you to get this done. I need you to do this or that because, you know, we need it to get this stock ready so that we have it ready for a soup tonight or for a sauce tonight. Or I need you to you know, learn how to, do, to get better at the reservation system because we need to take reservations. Versus actually teaching them that because, well, this will make you a better you know, manager or a better multitasker, or this will teach you how to make a stock so you can you know, make your own sauce one day. And, and I think a lot of us forget those day-to-day, you know, in and out uh, types of, of interactions we have. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I definitely agree. And then there was another part of what Abraham says, and that's about greatness is a byproduct of vulnerability. And most people are afraid to be vulnerable. So what do you feel like that means somebody stating like, oh, they don't, I don't know how to do this. So now I'm vulnerable because I look stupid. Or is it, what, what do you feel when it, when he says that greatness is a byproduct of vulnerability? Yeah, I think you just nailed it. I think it's, I think, you know, as, as leaders, as managers, as owners, I think a lot of us feel like we have to have all the answers, but really the only way we're going to, to not only thrive is by 
taking all the best ideas and the best you know, tools from everyone around us and then applying those to the work that we're doing. But you know, then on top of that also is, you know, if I have all the answers, then why do I need you around? <laughs> so when your staff makes it doesn't feel like they're connected to the mission, they don't feel like they're really contributing. And and that's really one of the biggest things and, and things I've learned through this next book I'm writing that, that I'll hope, hopefully have done by the end of the year is is about you getting people to not only buy into the mission, uh, but really doing that in a way where they are able to you know get better and grow themselves. And, and then it kind of takes care of themselves. I love that. That's exactly... That's like a major principle. I think that that's like the basis, the key recipe, the, one of the key ingredients for successful management and leaders in, in restaurants. And we can you can bring it, bring it anywhere else. But what I love about what you do, Chris, is that you can take like what people think like, setting a table. If you just keep telling somebody, do this, do this, do this, they might not understand why the fork is that way and why the, the wine glass is first and why, you know, how everything is set up. So it's like when you teach people and you take the moment to kind of explain, and that was on a simple level, but you really take the time to really share. And like you said, to be communicate with the person, then every, it's, you don't, it takes care of itself. Is that sort of what you meant? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think probably the greatest example of this from my own life is I, I've never been a very good student. You know, when I was in school. I, I kind of got by. Um, yeah, I went to a, a, a nice prep school in Atlanta. That, you know, fed into Ivy League schools, and, and I still went to University of Alabama, which is a good school, but not like Ivy League or Duke or you know University of Virginia. And I, in seventh grade, had to take you know foreign foreign language for the first time, so I took Spanish, and. I got a 71, which is, I think, barely passing, right? I think 70 was passing. And it was all because of the fact that I memorized what you, the, the words were, what the conjugations were, but I didn't actually understand and learn them for myself. So I retook Spanish one the next year, and I got an A, which I hopefully I probably should have because this is the same freaking material. <laughs> it's the same. Right, I got gotcha. But I also understood and learned, you know, how it works and why it works. And as a result, you know, every year from then on afterwards, you know, I got, I got an A and actually the whole reason why I got a, a double major in English and Spanish in college is because I was able to place out the first four classes uh, based on, you know, the way that I was able to perform in the placement test. And that all came because yeah, I didn't realize it at first because I was just trying to get by, you know, doing as little as possible, but I was able to understand the way it worked and then I was able to apply it. And it makes a lot more sense when you actually understand what's happening here. Right. And that makes it seem like the way when I, I did the same thing, I would always memorize something. But I think it's because everything was so test driven, like the results, like what you were going to score in a test or how you're going to perform on that test, that it, the whole nothing, everything else was just put aside. It didn't matter about understanding it. And so did somebody sh tell you that or did you just get that? Or did you just like, how did that? Because that kind of goes back to like, the greatness thing about trying to, you know, understand people might not know what greatness looks like. So people might not know, like you might not have understood, oh, if I understand this, then it's going to change everything. Like, how did that come to fruition? Oh, no, I, I definitely didn't know at the time because I, <laughs> two or three years later in, in 10th grade, I failed chemistry and had to take, spend my whole 10th grade summer in summer school for chemistry. I learned the same thing that, wow, if I actually understand this stuff, then I don't have to, to rely on my memorization. I can actually think through it uh, you know, in a thoughtful way that'll help me get to the solution versus if I just memorize. So it's, it's kind of like, it's funny because when I, we were driving somewhere, I pretty much put my Google Maps on or Waze, whatever you want to call it, on without fail, even if I know where I'm going. And Tina, my fiance, she's like, do you even know how to drive anymore? <laughs> it's like, right, right. So I'm getting these answers from from the devices you know in my hand uh, versus you know I know how to get there, and I think a lot of people, me included, uh, especially I think in the world we live in now, are so used to just getting all the answers and being able to get them you know so easily that we don't actually question you know what's being handed to us. Yeah, that's true. And then relating that back to your ne to your next book a little bit, what you're working on without you know kind of giving it as all away, is the premise for specifically restaurants with with this, or is it kind of a bit more of a broader business? 
You know, I um I wanted to have it more in a broader business context, but yeah, it's just for restaurants. Um, I thought that if it if it works and sells and connects with people, that I would maybe you know do a second version of it uh, that's a little bit more open and and relatable for other audiences. So. I think it it threads to larger businesses. Like when we talk, give examples, like with Jay Abraham, we can talk about, you know, greatness. We can talk about, you know, helping, coaching, mentoring people. We can talk about setting a table. <laughs> I think we talked about the setting a table last time, or we talked about light bulbs last time. A lot about light bulbs, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the why, and the and the why is important, and all of those. That's funny. So I was wondering, do you ever do you did you after our interview, after our episode that we spoke, did you look, did you look up more, or did you, or maybe our listeners did? I don't know. <laughs> In restaurants, like all those light bulbs are out. Oh no, it's yeah. I think that's one of the things I noticed in that place we went to for brunch the other day. Right. Why are these light bulbs not working? (laughs) That's so crazy. We are going to pause this episode for just a moment to hear a special message from Marie Petula. Hello, this is Marie Petula, owner of Union Restaurant in Pasadena, Need & Co. at Grand Central Market in downtown LA. And the Just Forking Around contest question is, what type of pasta literally mean little tongues in Italian? Linguini? Penne, vermicelli, or bucatini. For more information or to participate in the Just Forking Around contest, please visit the website, justforkingaround.net, click on the contest button, and voila, voila, voila. Way to win really, really cool stuff. Good luck. This episode is brought to you today by Aura Organic. I chose this company because I love the products. And this crew, they are young, cool, hip, a little bit quirky, definitely passionate people, and they're based out of San Diego. So Aura Organic, it's a sustainable, sustainable, plant-based organic supplement company. And I found them on Shark Tank. Yeah, I was intrigued. uh, So I started digging a little deeper and purchased their products and started using them. And now I want to share them all with you for a sweet deal. So some of the products that I've been really obsessed with right now over the past few couple few months now, one is called Trust Your Gut. So Trust Your Gut is a pre and probiotic. I really like the powder. I just mix it in the water. It dissolves really quickly and just take it right in the morning. And Trust Your Gut is... Um, you know, your gut's important. <laughs> it's your second brain. Um, mood, your mood is based upon, you know, what's going on in the microbiome. The microbiome is, uh, can be thrown out of balance, like stress, food, alcohol, oopsie, <laughs> exercise. So taking a probiotic daily is super, super important to maintain the balance in the microbiome. And the microbiome is, it's in your gut. And we can get into the details about that on, a, on another episode. But it's really important to keep your gut happy. Happy gut, happy person. <laughs> That's my mantra. Um, the second product that I've been using a lot lately is the Omega-3 Spray. Yes, instead of taking fish oil supplements... Uh, which are great, you know, omega-3 is really good for your brain, uh, for cognitive behavior, (laughs) if that's even a a word. It's really good for your brain. It's really good for your hair. It's really good for your nails, your skin. So I believe that everybody should have some of these in your arsenal, in your daily routine, your rituals in the morning. Um, A lot of you have been sending me feedback about the Easy Bean Green, which is the greens powder. People really love that. It's an organic alkaline green powder. Um, one scoop a day, boom, you're done. And again, everything's organic, USDA organic. The packaging is sexy. I freaking love this company and I'm excited to share with you aura.organic forward slash just forking around. Purchase as often as you want, any products that you want, and you will receive 15% off your entire order, not just one and done, when you use at checkout just forking around. So at checkout of the Aura.Organic website, just put in just 
Forking around, and you will receive a 15% discount off of their amazing products. Enjoy. And now let's get back to the episode with Chris Hill. So, Jay Abraham, he also talks a lot about goals, and this reminded me of you as well because he says goal, people's goals in life are flawed, they're too focused on an end result. It's more about the process. Don't lose focus on what provides actual fulfillment and satisfaction. And the meaning of life is the interaction between people. And I know that's right up your alley with your mantra. And you have like your seven principles of leadership from a while back. Um, So that reminded me of you. Do you have any any intel on that or any insights on that, what I just read? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, and that also actually, you know, ties into... Remember you spoke of the traveler's gift, I believe the book's yes, called. Yes. You know, where you're focusing on the the process, you're not as much the result. You know, if our goal was to to make everything say with our relationship very easy, then it probably wouldn't be very fulfilling in the end. Because we wouldn't have those difficult conversations, we wouldn't grow together, we wouldn't experience you know the, the things that really need to be experienced in order to grow in a way that is healthy and connected and, and vibrant. And I think it's the same thing with, with our communities and cultures at work. You know, I think it's, it's having the courage to have those difficult conversations. And, you know, on top of that, probably even more so is, is listening. You know, all of us have all the answers to everything and, and taking all the people that are around us and realizing that everyone can teach us something about you know everything and being open to that and not feeling like we have to have all the answers. Yeah, totally. I do you know Derek? I I, keep, I loved I, things remind me of you. I don't know if it's not like I'm obsessed with Chris Hill, but I do think of it. It's like Tina's gonna be like, "Who is that girl?" And I was like, I was thinking of you when I was when I was. Um, <laughs> Because I do, I do respect you a lot. I think you're you're awesome. So, and I think you know that. So, I didn't want to overly no. accuate you. Yeah, I don't want to embarrass you. So, Derek Sivers. Do you know Derek Sivers? He's been on some yeah. TED Talk. Yeah. So, I was he he's. This is something that was so interesting to me about goals because he says keep your goals to yourself. Do you do you ever watch? Did you watch that TED Talk at all? I did. Uh huh. Yeah, and so that when you share your goals and get acknowledgement, it's like that feeling makes you feel less, makes you less likely to do it. Like that, the mind is tricked. That the work is already done, and you feel satisfaction from the acknowledgement. So you're less likely to continue towards that goal. It's like when you're acknowledged by others, it seems done in the mind. And it's interesting because I think I think there's some shred of truth to that. And there's also some other ways than how to talk about something. You can state it in a different way, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what do you, what's your experience with that? Do you have any uh, experiences real life or with others that have experienced that? Well, I, I, um, I agree that to an extent, you know, I think it's kind of like I have a conversation with a buddy of mine on his podcast a couple weeks ago. And we were talking about how in the business world, he he helps coach entrepreneurs to be successful, you know, growing their small businesses. And he talk, we were talking about how you know a lot of people, you know, especially you see it on social media, somebody shares that they started this business, and how, like you're referring to, it, that implies that almost that oh, like they've already kind of done the hard work, but in fact, the hard work is just getting started, you know. Like starting a business, I can do that in 30 minutes by you know, hopping online and, and, and getting you know a, a business license versus the actual hard part is you know doing the work every single day that it comes after that. Uh, so I definitely agree with knowing that it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking to, to, to down that path. At the same time, you know, one thing that's really worked for me with, and I don't know if I can do this for everything, but when I do the books, it definitely helps is, is I will create a, a published date that's two months out, three months out. You know, I've already been working on it for so long. I've probably, once I've created the published date, I've already done most of the research. So I just have to kind of pull it all together and do the writing part. But by having that kind of lie in the sand, like, hey, dude, like people have already bought this book on Amazon. Now you have to deliver for them. Uh, so setting those kind of 
ouchy goals. Yeah, they're goals that push you. They you have to yeah, you have to reach exactly. it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Because at the same time, like I've also at times given talks where you know it's, it's a lot easier to you know, especially I'm seeing my living room right now. I have my computer where I'm talking to you through my computer, which is weird to think of anyway. Right. <laughs> but I have my my um my TV in front of me. You know, I have a nice patio with my garden outside. You know, there's a lot of different things that are easier to do than to work on a talk. So I can keep pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off till all right, now it's like this thing's two days away. It's now it's kind of too late versus, you know, if if I had to do, you know, something leading up to that, it would make it a lot easier to get done. Right. So I, I believe in that. I do, I do believe a little bit. It's, that's funny because I go back and forth too. So I was wondering what your, your take was on that because you definitely talk a lot about goals and journeys and, and setting you know, setting those picks where you, you kind of like know where you're at that maybe push you a little bit further. Because you have, I think you have that like athletic kind of mind or mindset. Right, right. And I think, you know, I think too, is as we venture down the, the path of our career, you know, whatever that looks like, if we don't share our goals with at least certain people, like our partner, our business partners, especially, but but our, our life partners, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, if we don't share with them, then I think it can be very lonely. And I think we need to, at least in some sense, share you know what it is that we're after, what we're trying to do, so that we feel that support, so that they can know to encourage us and know that they need to encourage us along the way. Otherwise, you know, it, it gets very lonely. And I think it can be very demoralizing. Right. And also the connections too. You might miss some of like the people that might know somebody that could help along the way as well. Without, That's great. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I agree. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, Chris, you're doing this? Hold on a second. I know this guy and this guy. They'd be great for you to talk to. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Do you do you refer back to your seven principles of leadership uh, still? I mean, I'm, I don't mean still, but do you do you bring that up and look at? I think was that it was a few years ago that was your. I don't know if I'm sorry if it was a TED talk or if it was um, one of your articles. Well, it originated about a year and a half ago, and that's really yeah. You know, so I started writing that book around then, kind of, and I put it on hold to, to write this book, Crush Your Career, and now I'm really almost probably next week going to be back into finishing that book up. So yeah, I focus on that a lot. And I think a lot of my work ties really back into a lot of those with, with uh, you know, having a vision and a process and being willing to you know listen and take the first bullet. And, I mean, uh, and it goes down the line. Yeah, I think it's, again, something also that we can apply to whatever it is we do with our careers, whether it's in the restaurant business or not. Right. Spread the credit. That was your number six. I like that. Spreading the credit because sometimes ego gets involved and it's, is that what you meant by that? Spread the credit? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, and, and yeah, be willing to, first is you know, being willing to know that you don't have all the answers, but then, you know, on top of that, it's letting people around you know that, Hey, you're doing a good job and I appreciate you doing this and, and not just, taking a, a team win as your win, but really embracing the uh, the entirety of the group because everyone from in a restaurant, from the dishwasher all the way up is important and needed for the restaurant to be successful. And, you know, and, and the talk that I gave that first kind of highlighted those seven principles, you know, I was talking about a football game and how, you know, if, if you at least know football a little bit, there's 11 guys on each team and, we mostly pay attention to the the quarterback or the wide receiver who catches the ball or the running back. But what we don't really realize is, well, there's all these guys, you know, the fat guys, you know, the linemen that are there to block the ones across from them. And if they don't do their blocking assignments properly, if they don't do their job then the play probably won't work and we won't even know about the quarterback or the running back or the wide receiver. So really knowing that everyone involved plays an important role and and knowing that those roles are different for everybody and we all bring different strengths and weaknesses to the table and really compensating for the weaknesses and maximizing strengths is I think one of the, the best ways to to really get there. Yeah, agreed. Do you miss cuz you don't work in the restaurants right now, do you? Are you not chefing? <laughs> That's my new word, chefing. Um <laughs> right now and I know that um you know you're I know you're super busy, your plate is full so, so to speak, but you 
I wonder, are you cooking at home? Are you doing... Do you still explore? I mean, are you dining out? What are you doing to stay aside from you know, writing and, and doing your podcast and, and speaking to chefs and um, other uh, restaurateurs? Anything to satisfy your... Yeah, you're creative because you're, you're a creative... You're a creative guy, you're a creative chef. So I wonder how you fulfill that. Yeah, there's there's probably two big pieces that I miss from not being in the kitchen every single day. And one's definitely the creative side, which I, I get to do, you know, some at home, but it's also, you know, I love being in the kitchen where you have like your sous chef or your line cooks and you have an idea and you're all kind of working on the same idea together. Like, oh, let's try it like this or like that. And then you finally get to a place where, ah, this is great. And like, we all came up with it together and it's really cool. So I love that idea of creativity and, and being able to to use that. But then, yeah, I also just love having a service, you know, going from, you know, you do the prep work, you get things ready, and then you have service. And yeah, I'm, I do do some consulting work. So uh, working with a, a company right now locally, you know, helping them. Uh, so yeah, I'm there some, uh, not as much as, as I, I'd probably like, but it at least keeps my my feet wet and keeps me, you know, in the in the game and I pulse on kind of what's going on. Right. Which the last time we talked, we were talking a little bit about well actually before we get to, well while we're on that is but we we're talking a little bit about like tech and like kind of future we were at talking about I was like as fast casual uh, as here to stay and, and that was we I think we agreed upon that or we had some intel on that. But then there was also, you know, the the finer dining, the white linen, like what just last time we talked was June, so it hasn't been that long. July, August, September. It's been three months. Um, I don't know if you can remember back, say, a few months ago. Have you seen anything slightly trending or slightly shifted that you were like, "Oh, wow!" When you went into any restaurants? Yeah. So I'm trying to remember. I, I think when we talked, Whole Foods had just been bought by Amazon. Yes, it had. It was just announced. I think a couple of days before. And so. Yeah, it'll be a little while before that whole merger goes into full effect, but I think that will definitely have a an impact on on the industry. You even I can't remember where I saw it, maybe in my local Whole Foods or somewhere, but it's you essentially said you know, now you can you know, order Amazon Prime Whole Foods products you know straight to your door and have them within an hour. Uh, yeah, I have a Whole Foods here, probably it's about a mile and a half, two miles away. So yeah, you know, I think. To go back to what I said a couple of months ago, I think it will continue to be this way is that companies have to really be mindful of you know how they're showing up in the marketplace, what kind of product they're putting out there, who they're attracting, and knowing that the bottom you know x percent is probably going to be cut out. Uh, meaning you know if you're a, a, a somewhere above fast casual but below, you know, a, a super fine dining or high end, then the Applebee's types places, Ruby Tuesdays, they're finding themselves not really being able to differentiate themselves in a very crowded marketplace. And I think we'll see a lot more of that uh, take place with the, some of those guys trying to reinvent themselves. And then you'll see also, I think, places like like uh, McDonald's and Wendy's and all those fast food places trying to get on board with the, which they already are, but getting on board with the 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 grub hubs and the uber eats and trying to make themselves more accessible and and also i think more fresh at least feeling and i think we also talked about being artisanal so yeah right <laughs> yeah, artisanal <laughs> at one point does like is it was it like you know burger king's artisanal or um you know arby's abby's beef and cheddar the artisanal yes. buns you know <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> That's funny. I'm excited to watch you as you're as you grow and and you're with your become married and you're gonna have a family and you're gonna have kids. Say at like and I and I and I have no no doubt that your kids are gonna be like so into food, right? <laughs> what if uh, fast forward a little bit and I know it's hard to say what the landscape will be like in the in the food world or restaurant world then. But what happens if your you know your 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 kid wants to go into a, a open a restaurant? What what would you say? You know, I think. The first thing I, I I hope to be as a dad is somebody that you know, obviously is there to to look after my kids and, and give them the support they need, but also someone that would get them to ask questions and seek answers for themselves, not because their dad did it or because you know someone else did it, but because you know, that's something that they really want to do. 
because I think it is a, it can be a very rewarding career. Um, at the same time, you know, it can be very challenging. And you know, if that's something they would want to do, I'd be all for it and try to support them. I, I think once I do have kids, uh, whenever that day comes, I think like a lot of parents you hear, they just want their kids to be happy. And I know that's how my dad feels for me. I think he was a little bit unsure of the direction that I, of me going down this route, but now sees how much happiness it brings me and, and knows that I made the right decision, you know, whether that's something he would have done or not. Right. That makes sense. That's, that's, that's awesome. What about, what about this scenario? Okay. Say real quick, say you, uh, somebody comes to you, which I'm sure, unfortunately, many people do, and they say, okay, this is what's going on. I have this restaurant, you know, it's it started to kind of decrease, um, and now I'm cutting costs, so I'm changing my, you know, raising prices, changing my food portions. Um, I just changed my concept a little bit, trying to focus, you know, not so much on vegetarian, but all-inclusive, um, but I'm still not making it happen, so I'm going to cut lunch out and just be open for dinner. I mean that was a, a, a random scenario, but what's the what's what's your thoughts? The first things you think about when when that, what would be the questions you would ask them? Well, yeah, I think the first thing is figuring out well why why are you doing this? You know, if it's a sales issue, is it because you know people aren't in your area during lunch hours? Okay, that that might might make sense to to shorten your hours and just do dinner, uh, but at the same time, you know. When when we had the the concept uh, where we had, we did a really popular lunch, we were able to bring people in early, and as long as we had enough sales to cover you know some some lunch, then then it didn't really matter because we had people you know prepping for later in the day. Right, it made sense. You could do it. if I, you would hit a thousand in revenue or whatever, say five hundred, that would cover the cost. So therefore, it was worth it. I, I think a lot of times people want to think they have the answer to to a certain problem but don't really look at it from an outside perspective or look at the full picture. So, you know, maybe lunch isn't working because you can't get the food out fast enough or maybe because you're overpriced. So I think before you make those decisions, you know, trying to understand what's actually really going on here and what, what before we do change our concept, which maybe we have to do, but assuming we have some sort of you know, brand loyalty because we're going to be open for dinner, maybe there is, something else at play that we can kind of tap into. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. That's, that's, I, it's funny because, um, uh, was I was overhearing a conversation. I didn't chime in. I wanted to, but I didn't. I should have. <laughs> but it wasn't really. They were just kind of going back and forth on what they what they were going to do. And and I was thinking to myself. And I was thinking of similar lines as you. And I was thinking, you know, I was wondering that would be a great question to ask you. I thought basically to myself, I was like, well, if it's full, if it's a full service lunch, what if you and you can't afford the it's expensive labor wise, but you're getting some sales. Then what is if you turn it into a, a more of a fast casual with like the so you only have to have a food runner and a and a maybe a busser and somebody to re, redo the drinks if that if that's the problem you know like so it's kind of what you said like kind of look at what it is that's going on. Or you have a, li- a limited menu where maybe you don't have uh, somebody on saute and you're just doing you know sandwiches and obviously soups are easy to just ladle so maybe you just do sandwiches it makes sense doesn't that make much more sense like to take a look at it i so i'm wondering if hopefully will some people are thinking like oh shit that makes sense but to really take a look at it like you said from outside and and you're saying don't have somebody on saute have the soup with the ladle maybe the the runner can do it so yeah, so I, I definitely agree on that one. I know we're getting closer to the hour, but there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about first. We talked a little bit before, we, you and I, we had pretty much sporadically decided to do the second episode, which is awesome. And I, I thank you and appreciate your time. Um, but we, talk, we were talking about a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what maybe to, to kind of nibble on uh, for topics. And one of them that did come up, do you remember when we were emailing? Uh, yeah, it was a little bit about which I thought to be extremely interesting, which was about to bring a present day situation, which is has to do with football, which we, you and I both love football and has, but it has to do with the football players kneeling and the differences we all have and how we can bridge the gaps in a positive, healthy way. And, you know, embracing them in environments, military sports teams, and yes, the kitchen. So what, can you explain a little bit more about that thought process? You know, and this is something I've been playing around with actually maybe writing an article. So this perhaps 
inspiration for that. What I alluded to earlier on in our conversation was, you know, I think we all want the same things in life. We want to be happy. We want to feel loved and like we're a part of something. And, you know, with, with all the challenges in the political realm and, you know, people not feeling like they're getting a, a you know a fair shake and other people on the other side that are kind of closed minded to what they have to say. Yeah, you know, I think the first thing to any successful team is first is respect. And through respect, we earn and build trust. So if you take, you know, a kitchen environment, you know, if you respect the people around you first, then you can develop the respect that you need to be successful. And that's really what, you know, I allude to recently also was, you know, with you know, having a vision, you can have a vision uh, and a game plan for, for what you want to do if, if say you're the, the president of the United States. But if you don't have people invested in that, even if it's a great game plan, they're not going to buy in. And the only way to get them to buy in is to have a mutual respect and have a mutual you know, trust. And, and it really comes down to feeling like the person on the other side, whether you're a chef or the president, is has your best interest in mind. Again, it goes back to you know, teaching somebody something for their benefit, not for yours, but for theirs. And when you, when you feel like somebody is in the interaction with you for your benefit, you're much more willing to do something for their benefit as well. I love that. I was thinking about, sorry, I was going to say something about the Patriots, but that would be inappropriate because your birthday wish did come true, the first game. Yeah. <laughs> when I gave the, um, my, the, the seven principles of successful leaders, uh, the very first talk, um, that was at the, the American Culinary Federation, a keynote talk up in Chicago. And that talk was right after, literally the morning after the Super Bowl where the Falcons you know, me being an Atlanta guy, I'm a big Falcons fan. You know, we lost to the Patriots the night before in the Super Bowl in dramatic, heartbreaking fashion. And uh, the whole night I was up wrestling. I, I couldn't sleep. I was just a, a complete wreck and a mess. But uh, still made it work. <laughs> yeah, and then your birthday wish was this year for the Patriots, who's and they did. But we, we can't talk about the Patriots because I am from New England. <laughs> yeah. I know. So I know I just want to... um take a minute to acknowledge you, Chef Chris Hill, and say bravo for for and to all of those people that you've helped, you've really assisted to transform their lives. So thank you for your gifts to the world. Well, uh, thank you for saying that. You know, I just uh, trying to do what I feel is is the right thing and, and give some guidance and some things that, you know, maybe I would have liked to have known back when I was, you know, starting out and more junior role myself. But thank you very much. And I appreciate you know, what you do with the podcast. And I know being a podcaster myself, that it's a lot of hard and often thankless work. So uh, keep up the good work. Uh, thank you, Chris. And my other question, I have two more. One is how can we support you right now? What's, what do you have for us? What, what can we do for you? Um, yeah, I think just, uh, yeah, I love connecting with people. That's kind of my oxygen with the work that I do is you know, hearing from people like yourself you know, that enjoy an article or, or share something on Facebook. And so, yeah, if, if you like anything that, that I'm up to, I'd love to, you know, hear what you have to say, whether it's a Facebook message or an email and, and um, let me know that it's making some in- impact, you know, big or small. And that's at chefchrishillonline.com. And we can get all your platforms there for your social media. And then my last question for you, the journal, what is your definition of success? So, you know, I think success is being able to do what I love, be able to make an impact doing that, and being able to have control over the important things in my life, my relationships, the amount of time I, I'm able to work or get to work, and making an impact along the way. I think a lot of people, you know, chase the wrong things. They think success is something that once I get, you know, this dollar amount, you know, my bank account, or I get this promotion, or I open this many restaurants, then I'll be successful. But you know, what I've learned and what I find over and over again hearing from different people is that when you focus on those things, then the bar just kind of changes and and, and you're climbing a, a higher and higher mountain and you never feel like you're getting there versus if you can you know, understand that 
success looks like this for me and making that about other people, then I think it comes a lot easier and you're able to appreciate the process along the way. All right. I love that. All right. Chef Chris Hill, part two. I love it. Thank you. We got a lot of information there. I just was hammering with questions. <laughs> just like, and you're probably just coming out of your, I was right. You were just penning. You were describing a, this like about to be released book. And I was just like hammering you. So thank you for your, for your answers and your participation and your support. It's, it's been a blast, Debbie. Let's uh, do it again soon. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Chef Chris Hill, thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Yes. Bye. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones. Please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just forking around podcasts. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at forking podcast. My website is just forking around.net. And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.